So our next speaker is Dr. Luke McCauley. He is from the University of Maryland Extension. Um, Luke, you're, I see that you're here and if you're ready to go, you can start to share your screen. Um, Luke is a wildlife management specialist and he has received his bachelor from Notre Dame and he also has a master's degree and a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, Luke conducts applied research to enhance the sustainability and enjoyment of wildlife resources in Maryland. Um, and he's got some current projects that are including testing cover crop varieties for white-tailed deer preference and the development of warm season grass establishment for declining grassland species such as the bob white quail. Um, I'm also working with Luke and, um, and Agnes who will be our next speaker on the Delmarva uh, Forestry Stewards Program. And I think uh, Agnes might mention that a little bit more a little bit later on. But, uh, but Luke, it's, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Blake. Um, well, I've, uh, this is kind of a new talk for me and uh, it's been taking a lot of time to put together, but I've got a whole lot of material to cover. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, let's, let's buck your seatbelts and let's get started. Um, everybody, I think uh, my daughter who did virtual schooling last year, uh, her teacher would oftentimes say, okay, all you kids jump up and do 10 jumping jacks. And they all go jump, do 10 jumps. So everybody in the, in the, in the class, I'm sort of joking, do 10 jumps, at least your mind sort of stretch and uh, wake up a little bit, uh, get off your seat or whatever. Um, let's get going. So here's, a, I'd like to show everybody where we're going in our outline today. Um, and just uh, I'll do a broad overview of just the diversity of wildlife in Maryland. Think about how to manage this kind of diversity. And then think about broad wildlife and habitat management principles. Uh, fourth, go into Delaware forests and the species of greatest conservation need. Popular game species, habitat, and wildlife management. I think a lot of people might really want to just focus on those, and we'll cover that too, and uh, go through some conclusions. So let's get started. Diversity of wildlife. I like these big uh, themes. So you know when we're progressing through the uh, outline, when you see these big pages. So. Um, I'd like just to just give a broad overview of, of what we're talking about when we say managing for wildlife. These numbers are all from Maryland, but uh, they'd be pretty similar for Delaware as well. But we have 97 species of mammals, 47 species of wildlife. Here's a snapping turtle. So different than those mammals and the deer and the, the raccoons. And then we have 42 species of amphibians in Maryland, probably a similar number in, in Delaware, maybe a, few, a little, little bit fewer. Uh, we have birds, all sorts of 443 species of birds in Maryland. Invertebrates, of course, we go into the tens of thousands of, uh, of species of invertebrates. We don't actually have a firm number of how many there are because not all of them have probably been described yet. Uh, and then hundreds of species of fish. So we have like these crazy diversity of wildlife. We have five major groups with hundreds of species within them. And even within birds, we have a lot of diversity. Let's look, let's just quickly look at birds. We have these forest birds, a pileated woodpecker. We have these edge birds. This is an Eastern Phoebe. They like the forest edge where the grasslands and forests meet. We have grassland birds that need these big expanses of grassland. Then we've got, oh, ducks. So yeah, we got ducks, these birds that live almost a, a very you know, water obligate species. So so many different types of things. And that, that's where I, I like to bring us to this part of objectives being key. Um, wildlife are so very diverse and your management approaches are gonna be very diverse depending on what you're managing for. So I have this picture on the left of, of a logging operation and I have a picture on the right of a tree planting operation. So in terms of forestry, either one of these things could be used to manage wildlife depending on what kind of species you're looking for. So, um, and I also like to think about broadly, okay, well, what, how would you start thinking about your broad management objectives? Many people might already have in their mind, I, I want trophy bucks. That's a, that's a really straightforward thing. And, and that's that third option, the third bullet, focal species of interest. Or I really want to see Bob White quail back again. But we also have some people might be interested in the concept of biodiversity. How do I maximize all the different types of wildlife and increase the species richness, the number of species I have? And then there's, of course, a really important category of the threatened and endangered species and ones that are in decline, um, which uh, Bob White quail are one. 
but uh, an endangered species. So there's these different ways also to think about how you might want to manage. So when we have such diversity, how do we go about doing it? So um, I actually used this uh, Delaware Wildlife Action Plan as, as a foundation for a, a big portion of my talk, this next section we're going to get into. It, is, it took three years to produce as experts from all these different taxonomic groups weighing in on, on what's going on in Delaware and things to think about. What are the species of conservation concern? It, you will learn a ton. It's a lot of material. It's up on the web. You Google Delaware Wildlife Action Plan, you'll pull it up. And there's a wealth of information there to get started and to really dig into this because there's more than we could even possibly cover when, with this kind of diversity of species between amphibians to deer to kestrels and, and, and insects and butterflies. So um, I, to sort of simplify it, I like to also help narrow. So what's feasible? I'm, this is a woodland, uh, uh, woodland group, woodland management group. So I've focused on on woodland and forest habitats, but what's feasible? What kind of forest do you have? That's one place to start and narrow yourself down. What is of greatest conservation need? Um, I'm gonna pause here. I saw I might've had a little bit of an internet disruption, but I, I think I'm back here. Um, so what's of greatest conservation need? So um, this booklet has a lot of good information on species that are in decline or threatened or endangered. And I think third and maybe most important, what are you interested in managing for? If you're going to be out spending your time on the landscape, what do you want to do? What do you see yourself feasibly having the energy and resources and ability to do? Because uh, that's, that's really doing something is more important um, than nothing in a lot of cases. And uh, if it's something you enjoy, I think you're much more likely to do it. So I think that's, I bolded that one because I think that's an important component here. So um, now we're going to dig into big, broad wildlife principles. Um, and I'm, I'll take a break here. And I, I'm noticing on the screen, I see myself with this mustache. And, and no, I don't normally have a mustache. Um, my, my daughter for Christmas wanted me to grow a mustache. So that's why I've got this goofy thing on my face. I mean, for me, I mean, some people look a lot better with mustaches than I do. Anyways, that's a little comic relief to break break up everything here. So um, I just keep seeing myself. I'm like, that doesn't look like me. Um, anyways, broad wildlife principles. So let's get dig into this. So something that has changed my life in terms of understanding the plants and animals around me in Maryland. Uh, I, I came, uh, I, was, I was raised in Texas, uh, spent a lot of time in California, and so I'm relatively new to Maryland. And this has saved my life in terms of identifying what is all around me, because I didn't grow up with a lot of these species like this green tree frog. You can take this app on your phone and point it at a plant or an animal, and it will oftentimes remarkably well give you the species that you're looking at. It doesn't work perfect. Uh, it sometimes makes mistakes, but I have been very impressed. And so it, will, it has changed my ability to learn about the natural environment around me. I highly recommend it. There are others as well as this one. This one's called Seek. Um, it doesn't upload anything into the cloud. It's all just stays local. There are other ones like iNaturalist that goes up into the cloud and it's more of a sharing thing. Those are great too. I, if you just want something to just learn what's in your backyard, I think this is really great. So um, identifying what you have is really important. The trophic pyramid. It's this idea that at the bottom of this pyramid, you have plants and the energy levels kind of get reduced as you move up in this pyramid where you have plants and then the animals that eat the plants, which are herbivores. You have your primary predators, your snakes and frogs, the things that are eating those insects. Um, then you have secondary predators and you could go up and some, there's these apex predators and things like that. So you have this sort of idea of this trophic pyramid where these animals and life on our planet sort of moves, it falls somewhere on this, on this large pyramid. Um, pyramid. And then you have the food web. Many of us saw this when you uh, took science class growing up as kids. Um, and this is just one version of one. Uh, it's uh, simplified, obviously. We don't have 5,000 uh, or 500 animal species on here, at least. Um, but it gives you a sense of how interconnected everything is. And I like to just bring us back to this, um, just so we all remember, like, if you 
if you're affecting things somewhere on this pyramid, it has these um, different effects. So for example, uh, pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizer. Um, some of these things can have a really big impact on certain pieces of that food web. Now, these things have a place and they have a real important, these have really changed agriculture and changed our ability to manage our environment and to control invasive species and to do all sorts of great things. But they also have the potential to cause a lot of damage, especially when it comes to um, certain types of uh, insecticides, for example. And, and again, I've, I used them. There are certain places where you follow the label and that's, that was on that last slide is that make sure you follow the label and just use them responsibly. But um, in terms of wildlife, let's look at this food web on the right. Let's see if I can get this go for, okay. Say you hate spiders and you don't want a single spider around in your yard. Well, the unfortunately the, the uh, permethrin is oftentimes one of the insecticides used. It is non-discriminating. You can't get it just to hit spiders. And by the way, my wife's an arachnologist and spiders actually don't bite you that often. And actually most spiders will run away from you and are, are not very dangerous at all. Um, so I have to put a plug in for that. But I understand some people have fears. It's a very innate thing. Anyways, you wanna get rid of these spiders, you spray for permethrin and, and you're, you're, you say you have a three or five acre yard, just get rid of them. Well, it also takes out all these other insects and then it has these carry on effects up the food chain because so many things depend on our insects. Um, and I just want to kind of bring us back to think about that. So next, as we move along in our broad principles is habitat. Here's an image of uh, some forested and agricultural area in Maryland, Southern Maryland. And these green lines are the, are the ownership boundaries. So you have a lot of fragmentation on smaller parcels and a few larger ones. Um, but I brought, bring this up just because I like to look at habitat from these four main concepts, food, cover, water and space. And again, these are sort of those fundamental concepts of habitat. We'll dive in a little bit deeper to what these all mean because they mean a lot of different things for different species. Here's a zoomed in section of that. And here's you see on this picture, it's like, oh, there's this forest running through the middle and you have uh, these agricultural areas on the sides. You have riparian areas. There's probably some, some, some wetlands, and brushy areas. Uh, when you look at some of the habitat maps of that exact same thing, it adds this whole other layer of complexity and color to this. You can see that this yellowish stuff is, is actually a creek and a river running through this forest area, uh, at least a wetland. So you can start to see there's a lot more than just on the surface for habitat. The arrangement really matters in terms of, of what happened, of what your area can support. Um, of this whole slide, these are different ways in which you could arrange habitat for different species. In this case, this is oriented towards uh, Bob White quail. But the real slide that really sums it up for me is this color one on the bottom right. And it's kind of small, and in hindsight, I should have just blown up that one. But all these little circles show the intersection of four types of habitat um, of these different colors. And this is a bit simplified, but it helps us to understand the point. If Bob White quail need each of these four types, you've only got a here in the middle of this big square. If you look at this picture on the right, you see a much more complex mosaic of different habitats and a lot more opportunities where you have the, these different habitats coming together. So that's arrangement. Um, also, thinking about that big food pyramid, and at the base of that food pyramid is plants. That's uh, the sun feeds photosynthesis for all the plants on the planet, and that provides all the energy that supports animal life on the planet for the most part. Um, so understanding how plants change over time and through the growing season is also really important. Uh, this slide basically shows that in the spring, you have very little bit of plants on the left-hand side, you have these small little plants, but, and they have, and the, these lines are sort of stylized. They have, they're low in fiber and they're low in stems. Those are things that a lot of animals can't really digest that well. Um, on the upside, there's not a lot of them, but on the upside, they're very high in crude protein and minerals. And as you move through the season, the quality of the forage declines, even though the quantity of the forage declines, uh, increases. So you have more amount, but you have less quality. So this is something to think about 
in terms of when we start thinking about how animals who depend on plant species, where they fit in and think about how plants change and how that influences their diets. So that's, that's an annual scale of forage quality. This, is, this happens every summer, you have this sort of change. We also have changes in forage quality and food and habitat over years and over decades. And that's this concept of succession, it's something that Bill just mentioned a lot in his last session. This is a great picture that just shows uh, in, a, in a quick, I really love this picture, quickly look at it and see, this really just sums up succession in one picture. Um, on the left, you have grasslands and open habitat areas. And as time progresses, especially out here on the East Coast, um, these grasslands will quickly develop into these shrublands with brambles and saplings, and they'll quickly move into these larger, um, I think they call them pole, uh, I forget the name, I'm not a forester. Anyways, these sort of small uh, sapling, larger sapling trees, and then on up into mature forests. This happens relatively quickly out here. And you can see on all this on this slide, uh, and this comes out of the Woods in Your Backyard publication uh, from one of my colleagues uh, helped put together, Jonathan Cage. And they have a great booklet and training program. I recommend it if you're interested in learning more. Um, but uh, it just shows all these different wildlife species and where they actually prefer different spots on this uh, succession picture. You can see there's um, and this is, again, isn't perfect because some species will move in between them, but it just gives you a sense for how there's certain, especially some bird species really like this early sort of mid succession type habitat. Some are really dependent on this early succession. You have quail, uh, grasshopper sparrows, meadowlarks, they really need these big areas of grassland, whereas uh, pileated woodpeckers would be up here um, on the right in these mature forests. Um, what changes succession? How do we go back in time uh, or how do we reset this process? Because that's what these um, species on the left need. They need this mature forest to go back to these young forests in order to have habitat. So really the big picture thing is disturbance, some level of disturbance that resets and moves these mature forests back to these grasslands. Um, it could be fire, it could be disease, We've had emerald ash borers knocked out probably at least 50% of the tree cover in my backyard. Um, logging, plowing, mowing, grazing. These disturbances help to either knock it back at some stage or keep it in that early stage. So these are all very natural processes. They've been part of our ecosystem for thousands, for millennia. And something to understand is it's part of the natural system in which our, many of our wildlife species have evolved. Uh, our first talk was all about invasive species management, and that was great. Um, Japanese stiltgrass is all over the place. Um, there's, uh, you, we've covered quite a bit of this, but understanding how these can change the quality of forage, the quality of seeds, food available for wildlife is really important. Uh, and again, that app, getting back to that app where you can go and take a picture of something and get a pretty good sense, is it an invasive species? It's great at identifying Japanese stiltgrass, multiflora rose, it picks them up right away and it pretty, it's pretty good at knowing what those are. So, um, cruising along to our next stage. So we covered all these sort of broad wildlife management principles now going on to forest habitats in Del Delaware. Because we're woodland, this is a woodland session where I think I focused in on that state wildlife action plan, the forest habitats that are in that plan. And at the same time, we're gonna cover the species of con greatest conservation need that were identified in that plan. So here's the big picture of what Delaware forests look like. We have six major types of habitat as identified in that uh, report. Um, and these are, these are listed in order of how many acres in the state they comprise. So really most of the, the broad majority of forest habitat in Delaware is these top three. And you have a couple of, a uh, few other types um, that uh, we'll go through as well. But let's get started. We're gonna take some pictures and look at some of the wildlife in these. Uh, this is the mesic mixed hardwood. This is the most common forest habitat type in Delaware. Here's a nice map from the State Wildlife Action Plan that shows them. They're widespread. They're across most of the state. Um, they found in moist, acidic, often nutrient-poor soils, characterized by tulip poplar, beech, oaks, hickories, 
And if you have a forest in Maryland, it's probably this mixed uh, music mixed hardwood. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Here's a picture um, that they provide what that looks like. And they've identified a few uh, species of greatest conservation need. Now, again, um, things change all the time. So there are other species that might be of great conservation need found in these forests, but these are a couple that were listed as tier one species in these forests in that state wildlife action plan. Uh, this is the Eastern tiger salamander. I've never seen one of these things. I'd like to, I think they're one of the largest amphibians uh, in the, on the continent. Um, they're apparently very secretive, hard to find. Um, okay, is everybody, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, hard to find, but they are present in these forests and they actually don't spend a lot of time in the water. You might assume there must be in the, in the creeks. They're out in grasslands and the forest understory, um, oftentimes spending time in burrows, but really interesting, cool species. Uh, in terms of birds, the hooded warbler, I may have seen one of these recently, uh, but they like these mature deciduous forests with dense understories. Again, these are some of the things to, to look for. And, and it's often, it's common to find mature deciduous forests, but not so much with a dense understory because oftentimes it's shaded out from the trees above, or as somebody mentioned earlier, we have white-tailed deer that browse and eat everything under that understory. Um, they also uh, use these smaller forest patches as long as there's a shrubby understory. So that's a, another species just to think about if you have one of these forests um, of, of greater conservation need, or if you see one on your property, uh, it's pretty exciting because they're not super common and abundant. Uh, here's another one called the cerulean warbler. Also exists in these large tracts of deciduous forests. Um, they do find that gaps, this is from the US Fish and Wildlife Service on the second paragraph, Gaps in the forest canopy or small forest openings appear to be important. Now, what that's all about is that oftentimes these species, uh, especially when they're breeding and they're trying to feed chicks, they feed their chicks protein rich insects and caterpillars. And so these openings in the forest have all these pollinators coming in, they have all sorts of insect life that's in these forest openings, and a lot more herbaceous matter hitting them, hitting the ground. So they're able to forage a little bit more in those areas. So that's the first category. Second, coastal plain oak pine forests. Again, a very pretty, pretty common, the second most common forest habitat in Maryland. Uh, dry, acidic, drier. So the, this compares to the other one is that these are drier, still acidic, and tend to be sandier soils, found more in the southern part of Delaware. Uh, sometimes have pine as co-dominant. Here's a picture of that kind of forest. Um, and the only species of conservation concern that they listed was the Delmar or fox squirrel. So here's a picture of that guy. He, he uh, prefers uh, these mature forests and then look at closely at the detail describing it with an open understory. So we already have a bit of a conflict. So we're gonna make for fox squirrels and great for those, uh, those shrubby understory I think cerulean, uh, the dense understory of the hooded warblers, or also some of the, uh, uh, the cerulean that don't need as much of the dense understory, but the hooded warblers do. So you have some conflicts again, so that you have to sort of prioritize, well, what are you gonna go for? Or can you, do you have enough space we can do a little bit of both? The Piedmont oak forest found up in the northern part of the state where you still have some of that Piedmont soil types um, uh, characterized by Oftentimes, a lot of oak trees, chestnut, um, and hickory trees. Uh, you have a lot of different uh, wildlife species in here, and the ones that came up for here's a picture of what it looks like. If you live up there, this that's what you have. It's different than the other forests in the state in the north, the north versus the south, and a lot of that's driven by your soil types and the uh, geography. And this this forest also has uh, the cerulean warbler, so it also um, provides that habitat type. Basic mesic forests, these are moist forests uh, with neutral pH soils. So very uh, much dominated by tulip poplars and a highly diverse herbaceous layer. Um, here's a picture of what that looks like. A lot of ferns in the understory here. Uh, and the hooded warbler uses this type of habitat. So we, we see a lot of these, these same birds showing up in these different habitat types, but it's, it's nice to kind of go through them as well, as well as the cerulean warbler uses these mesic. Habitats. Uh, we have maritime forests. These are really forests that are 
that have salt spray, they tend to have very highly influenced from the ocean and they, that creates very kind of a different, uh, they might be flooded from time to time or when hur hurricanes or big storms uh, might cause um, some changes of salt spraying, things like that. Here's a picture of one of those. And the tier one species listed in here is the red corn snake. Um, and they prefer, prefer these types of forests with an understory as well. And finally, our last type, this is the smallest uh, acreage type of forest in Delaware. Perhaps somebody on this call owns some land of, of one of these forests. It'd be really interesting. Um, they're, they're considered extremely dry and they're on these inland sand ridges. Apparently these types of habitats are really important for a variety of invertebrate species, but also for, here's a picture of what they look like, um, but also are really great for some snakes. Apparently the scarlet snake uh, does well and likes these sandy soils for burrowing. Um, and it's found in, in these types of habitats, as well as the red corn snake, which we saw a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the threats potentially to the red corn snake is that it's easily collected uh, for the pet trade. And so that might be a cause of concern for how, for its population. Okay, so now we covered a lot of forest habitat. That was like a laundry list of six different types of forests, but hopefully that was useful for covering and understanding, you know, where you might fit or your property is and what type it is and maybe some of the highlighted species of conservation need that are there and things you might want to think about doing for them. But now I think it's really important to also hit the popular species because I think a lot of people really come to this and I think it's good to be involved and think about species that make people excited. Um, and I'm going to cover it really quickly deer, turkey, wood ducks, and quail. And just, just to hit a few, um, if you like other ones, I'm going to have a section at the end where you can put into an evaluation or you can put it in the chat, things you'd like to hear more about in future talks. I just pick these because they, they tend to be pretty popular species. Um, I'll say many of them in general, if I had to pick something, they love edge habitat and forest openings. They, they need access down, they often have their ground nesting birds or ground based birds or um, deer in the case of deer herbivores they are eating the herbaceous understory and they need light to get down to the ground to feed, to feed their bellies, to grow plants and feed their bellies. Uh, they can't access stuff that they can't feed. So here's an image of uh, the Millington Wildlife Management Area up in the northern part of, I think it's in maybe in Kent County, Maryland, close to the Delaware border. And you see that they've done a lot of work to create these sort of patches where you have these forest openings. These might be clear cuts. They might be areas that have just been cleared uh, mostly for wildlife. And I think a lot of this is also for managing for quail, uh, some of the last remaining quail populations on the Eastern shore. Um, but those, uh, let me back up. These are also, because I mentioned deer, uh, are also really good. It, it just opens up the canopy for animals that need this higher, this herbaceous layer on the bottom, on the ground. And white-tailed deer are one of them. Um, they are generalists. They uh, but they do benefit from lots of edge habitat. There are so many of them in Delaware and Maryland because we have these sort of great, uh, very, a lot of edge. You have a lot of small parcels of forest and a lot of small parcels of agricultural land and they're interspersed very well. So these deer really like to be able to take cover in the forest, and come out in the, at night and eat all the agricultural crops. And that's another piece of what I work on. Um, and so they have like their, their bedroom and they have the dining hall over with all the soybeans and corn. Um, so, uh, things, some things I think are really interesting to think about for white-tailed deer, and if you're thinking about managing your land for them, is their energy, energy needs and how they change. So, check my time here. I, I think I've got a little bit longer. We'll, we'll be good. Okay. Energy needs. They increase, um, especially there's this key point. This is a, is a graph over the calendar year of a doe that becomes pregnant and that's where the pinkish red color comes in. And these are, as that line goes up, it's their energy needs. The brown, the brown at the bottom is a sort of just like maintenance. That's like sort of all they need just to survive. But once they get pregnant, those energy needs start to go up. And then once they have give birth and start lactating and producing milk, their energy needs go up even more. So it almost, in some cases, doubles from their maintenance needs. So they're having to basically eat for two, literally as mostly though, as when they're lactating. 
and producing milk for those fawns. So this is a time when you see a lot, you might see all of a sudden deer showing up and eating all, all the plants in your yard because they are just starving for nutrients and trying to get everything. Um, here's that picture of that uh, forage quality. I'm gonna move quickly over this because I already showed it. But if you wanna increase forage and nutrition for, for deer or they track deer, um, there's two main kinds. This is a great publication by Craig Harper out of Tennessee. A lot of the plants apply here in Maryland, and I'm sorry, and in Delaware, sorry. Um, and uh, really great resource. They'll go through everything you need. Um, but really, basically, you have two main kinds. They're the warm season plants, the soybeans, cowpeas, lab lab, joint vegetables, corn. Corn is great if you're growing corn. A lot of our crops are great warm season plants and feed deer really well, as we see. And we have these other types of cool seasons, and that's what a lot of the cover crops are. Clovers, wheat, brassicas, um, uh, winter wheat, oats, rye. Um, those all provide a lot of forage in the winter. You plant them in the fall and they provide green forage in the winter time. So that's basics in terms of how to increase forage for deer. Um, and I also wanna talk about a little bit about quality deer management. And that's the idea of enhancing buck harvest quality and quantity while reducing densities. Now I had a pretty picture of a deer in here, but it's not showing up. But the two main ways you can try to improve your deer quality on your property, especially if you have neighbors that want to work together on this or you own, happen to own a larger property, um, is age structure. The second is your buck to doe ratio. And those are things you can influence through your management to try and increase your quality and quantity of, of deer on your property. Um, age structure, uh, especially when it comes to the mature bucks on your property. If people want to hunt quality trophy deer or, or at least grow them and see more of them, it means you really want to preserve and leave these younger, younger bucks to mature into the four and a half or five and a half year age class. And they're really majestic to see on the landscape. There aren't many of them because they have, they're so sought after. Many of them don't make it past three and a half years. Um, but if you leave them and pass on them until uh, they get mature, then you have a lot more interesting um, dynamics with your deer herd that happen. Um, this is a great chart. There are several up on the internet. They describe the things to look for to be able to age your deer on the hoof. So you can think, okay, um, we're going to only shoot deer that are four and a half years old and older. And so you're able to like allow animals to mature, grow into maturity. The second piece of that, oh, here's my pretty picture of the buck and doe, uh, is there's this buck to doe ratio. And normally, commonly, there's three to five does per buck. And part of that is because uh, you have a lot more mortality of fawns that are, that are male fawns. Um, and you also have, obviously, hunters preferentially seeking um, male deer. But you can improve this ratio to one to two or even one to one. And if you can reduce your doe populations and have this ratio be more balanced, you'll see all sorts of interesting things start to occur um, in social behaviors of the deer herd in terms of buck competition, grunting, and also potentially some beneficial things about concentrated, concentrated fawning season. So all the fawns will be born at a more narrow band in time. And that, that can also help with a lot of uh, uh, reducing predation fawns. So, there's a whole lot more to that um, than I'm going into, but these are just two aspects just to think about. I'm happy to talk more if anybody wants to dig into this, but we've got to cruise ahead and I believe I have seven more minutes. So I'm going to leave some time for questions if I can. Uh, wild turkey, a lot of different habitats. Generally, open bottom um, is preferred. They eat mostly vegetables and a little bit of uh, vertebrates, frogs, and small snakes, and uh, mostly invertebrates, though. Uh, our wood ducks, again, and as time goes on, this little chart shows the proportion of, of invertebrate versus plant matter that is consumed by wood ducks um, at different times of the year. So, and by, diff, by, uh, by females and males. Basically, the stipple parts, the plants, and you have, um, you have basic, and the white parts, invertebrates, mostly invertebrates. So you have laying females eating a whole lot of invertebrates. So again, this means uh, uh, making sure you maintain those bug populations. And I go back to that 
that label in the very beginning, we had like the, the pesticides and herbicides. A lot of those pesticides and herbicides, you can spray them before rain and you put too much, it gets into the waterways and it can, they, a lot of invertebrates can just be annihilated from these things and it spreads. They're very sensitive to it and it can just kill entire invertebrate populations of the whole stream. And you can imagine if that happened at the wrong time, it could be really detrimental for uh, a wood duck hen that is laying eggs that needs 80% of his diet in invertebrates. So this is trying to, again, bring us ties back to that food web and why, how we can manage and how our actions can, can influence um, these animals. Uh, continue on, next slide is that food web. Next thing, a lot of people do uh, wood boxes. I have one in my backyard. Um, the one thing I'll say, just really briefly, they're great. They require maintenance, make sure you check in on them. And most importantly, make sure you put a predator guard on them. If you're not doing a predator guard on your bluebirds or your wood ducks, snakes have figured out how to find these raccoons. They, the predators know how to find these boxes and they're an easy meal. And it can actually be detrimental because you're losing, um, you're losing uh, eggs that might have hatched if they're in a natural um, cavity. So uh, highly, highly recommend if you're gonna do it, to use a predator guard. Great way to see, interact with nature and things. Like I love them and it helps the wildlife. So I think it's cool. Just um, it's also no fun to see a snake pop out of the box. Um, well, real quick, uh, of the biggest declines, this chart shows the biggest declines of bird species in Maryland over the last 40 years or so. Number one is northern bobwhite. If you look at the colors, the color coded, the green ones are tend to be grassland or young forest habitat. Nine of the top 10 need brushy or early succession habitat. We are losing birds at a very fast rate because of the, well, really, I think the, the losses of these types of habitats. So uh, Bob White Quill are at the top of that list. Um, they have three kinds of habitat need, the nesting areas and the warm season bunch grasses brooding areas where the chicks can grow up and he had actually a lot of bare ground for the chicks to be able to run around uh, and then escape pub like shrubby escape habitat like brambles and blackberries and these things that are messy and we want to just mow and have it nice and clean well that sort of stuff is really what quail need to survive as well as a lot of other species uh, you need to have a rotational system to maintain that early succession habitat for those species whether it's disking probably the easiest thing to do is disking uh, fire, if you can do it. Harvesting um, is great. We've heard a little bit about that. And the last is not preferred, but mowing at the late season can work as well. I'm running out of time, and we're going to have some you know, talk about forest management. Basically, I think you've already, already made the point is this sort of this open understory, um, openings in the forest um, are really important, but also uh, we're also missing a lot of old growth stands. So this don't have to clear all forests, of course, um, but uh, so there's a, a variety of things you can do and focus on for forest management. So conclusions, how to move forward, bring us back to this slide. What's feasible on your property? What's the greatest conservation need? And what are you interested in? What would you like to manage for, whether it's biodiversity, threatened and endangered species, or your focus species of interest? Um, and finally, and I'll close with this, um, use this identification app to learn about what's on your property. There's these great new tools. And the big takeaway is that disturbance and harvesting and management is really beneficial. It's not, not something to be scared of. I know um, when I moved here, I was like, ah, oh, can I, do I want to take something out? Do I want to like cut this brush back? And these are sort of challenges and some aspects is like, am I going to hurt something by cutting something? Well, I'll say, the habitat out here is highly resilient. It has very fast moving succession. If you cut something down, it will come back very quickly. Um, and so that's another aspect of takeaway. So with that, I will stop and say thank you. I guess I got two minutes for questions. Uh, if you have a sec, uh, want to give me some feedback, this little barcode thing, if you take your phone and just like take the, put in the phone, the picture app, the sort of a photo thing and actually just hold it up there on it, it will usually should take you to like a, uh, a website where you can take, give a survey and give me feedback. Of course, emails down here, lukemack at umd.edu for feedback or questions. Um, hope we have a few, a few seconds to go through a few. Thank you all very much.
Thank Thank you. You. I appreciate that. That was excellent. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions? That usually means you've done a fantastic job. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, you know, and like I said, he's got his email up there. So if anybody has any questions for him, just let oh. us know. Yep. Does he have any, anything to add about foxes? About foxes? Yeah. And open spaces and woodland. Did you hear that question, Luke? Uh, could you repeat it real quick? Something about foxes? What could be done for them? or? Yeah, what could be done to accommodate them on, um, in forests and open ed and open spaces within? I think um, generally they're pretty, you know, foxes, I think, do well. They're pretty much a generalist species. They do well. And I think they, again, they're, you think about that food web, um, you know, the mice, snakes, other small vertebrates that they feed on. I know they do well in forested areas, riparian zones, also in these agricultural areas. So I think um, anything you can do to, I think to prevent anything that might cause unexpected mortality on them, there, you know, one thing I see a lot of foxes with is this mange. Uh, uh, people, can, you can treat the animals for that, but a lot of people just, uh, advise against that from interfering too much with the, the wild populations on something like that. But um, I don't have a lot of specific things besides uh, trying not to, uh, I would say it's probably similar to what the, the deer and a lot of the species, they're generalist species, keeping a diversity of habitats, having some openings and some forests, I think would generally be good for them. Uh, but they're gonna be probably present or absent but independent of the habitat because they can survive really in a lot of different habitats. I've seen them living in suburban areas, so they're very uh, adaptive. So um, I'm not sure I could say like really clearly um, anything specific you can do okay. beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.